Sir Stanley Matthews is an icon of a lost era. Black and white newsreels, belching chimney stacks, terraced streets, workers pouring out of factory gates, an era, as one comedian might describe it, synonymous with jumpers for goalposts. For a young man with talent, the fastest route out of these pre-war cliches was sport. Stanley Matthews signed on at Stoke City, his local club, aged 14. He was in the first team at 17 and was playing for England at 19. He had the talent in abundance. Strange as it now seems, doubts surrounded his ability, or at least his effectiveness, from the outset. He played in the so-called Battle of Highbury in 1934, when England beat Mussolini's flag wavers and the then world champions, Italy. It was a vicious and sour game that reflected the politics of the time. And even though England won, Matthew's critics said he hadn't been muscular enough, nor committed enough for the rough and tumble of international football. His England career had had its first question mark placed against it. Well, he was still playing ten years later, but the war had moved from Highbury to encompass the world, including his hometown of Stoke. At Stoke-on-Trent, the King and Queen visit a large pottery works, a happy occasion for the work people who give their majesties a real Stoke welcome. The King and Queen were also present to see Stoke's favourite son orchestrate the destruction of international sides on the football field. Good footwork by Matthews, England's outside right, carrying the ball to the Welsh goal mouth. By now, Matthews was a media darling. His skill, allied to his innate humility, had made him a hero. And he put thousands on the gate wherever he appeared. The scoreboard tells the history of dazzling forward play, which has seldom been equalled. For some reason, and to the consternation of the Scottish supporters, he reserved many of his finest performances of this period for the old enemy. Cataloguing the goals, we start off with Hagen opening the score for England. 60,000 thirsty throats were heard all over Manchester as Stanley Matthews, the wizard of dribble, planted a free kick on Lawton's head and the ball went in for number two. The white-shirted English players are right on top of form. No opposition could stand up to the speed and punch of their forwards. Third goal came in a smashing kick from Carter. At this time, he was stationed near Blackpool, serving with the RAF, and was guesting for the local team. This connection would bear fruit some years later, when the war was over. And Lawton slams in another one. Now Scotland knows how Wales felt at Wembley. Eleven weary Scotsmen resigned to their fate. Up came Stanley Matthews, and then there were eight goals. Internationally, Matthews and England had reached a peak. Domestically, though, he was dogged by bad luck in the oldest cup competition of them all, the FA Cup. The first talking point from this year's revived FA Cup came from the Spurs-Stoke soccer battle. Press critics started the argument by panning Stanley Matthews. They said he played a poor game and Spurs defender Ronnie Burgess was too much for him. Pathé cameras saw it differently. Here is Matthews, number seven in stripes. And just watch him go. The man with the magic feet is still England's outside right number one. The next year he was a Blackpool player. Score at two Blackpool are again on the attack. Stanley Matthews, who has been shut out effectively, beats Manchester's Johnny Aston. But the seaside is finishing his tour. Charlie Mitten, number He had transferred for the bargain price of eleven thousand five hundred pounds. But he was 34, and surely didn't have many years left in the game. His luck in the FA Cup continued to be poor. Their 4-2 victory, snatched in the last few minutes, gives Manchester United the reward they richly deserve. He did, however, have the consolation of being named the inaugural British Footballer of the Year. Streamline Stanley, turning on speed that would do a sprinter credit, plays perhaps the greatest game in his career. It's from his centre that Johnny Hancock scores goal number two. And it's Matthews again. What a player. Without doubt the greatest winger of all time.
1949, Matthews was 35 years old. In the attack, old-timer Stanley Matthews is having a lean day. Two defenders mark him non-stop and Billy Steele is there to help them out. And England were considering alternatives for his position. But the strongest case for including him came when they left him out. It's a great day for the Irish. At Goodison Park, 50,000 see the soccer sensation of the season, England's first ever home defeat by a foreign team. Pathé sports cameras tell the full story of how 11 men from ERA upset the white shirts of England. With goalie Williams and his defenders facing early bombardment, the golden-lined England team failed to find their feet. Brilliant players that we know them to be may shed their skill with the sun and turn a vital international into a kick-and-rush hurly-burly. Man of the match is veteran Johnny Carey. His shrewd pass signals Aira's first goal. Peter Desmond is tripped in the forbidden area and Scottish referee Moad blows up for a penalty. The Goodison crowd is hushed as Con Martin takes the kick. Only just over the line. Portsmouth's Peter Harris starts off an all-out England attack in the second half. But there's no one there to finish off the promising approach play. Pye, Mannion, Morris, they've all left their shooting boots in the dressing room. The crowd sighs for a Lawton or a Matthews to show them how. Inspired by their one goal lead, Aira profit from some lucky escapes and draw still further ahead when evidence Peter Farrell slams in number two. The England forwards keep plugging away, but Lady Luck favours the Irish. Say the critics to the selectors, how about bringing back Lawton and Matthews? Blackpool are keeping up the pressure. One goal is in 1951, Blackpool beat Birmingham in the semi-finals. But the ball goes to left winger Perry, 40 yards out. A brilliant run through the defence, and he shoots. He was in the final of the FA Cup once again. Blackpool 2, Birmingham 0. Neutrals everywhere were willing him on to a winner's medal, a prize for his overall contribution to English football. Matthews again. He's trying every trick he knows to get Blackpool going. Even the Newcastle side wish he could have a cup winner's medal so long as they win. It wasn't to be. Then two years later, in 1953, the jinx was broken in one of Wembley's most legendary contests. This match has been known ever since as the Matthews Cup Final, something he himself found excruciatingly embarrassing. Bolton have looked the better team right the way through the first half. In the Blackpool girl farm faces a shot from Langton. He and Lofthouse miss, and there's another one. Bolton are two, Blackpool still one. Into the second half, and Blackpool begin to show some of the skill we expect of them. Stan Matthews is after it, and off he goes with a dazzling display that proves he's as good as ever he was. As he centers, Mortensen gets out of the way to let Perry shoot, but it's wider the net. Now the Wanderers get their forward machine moving again. From the right wing, Douglas Holden centers, and despite his injury, Eric Bell heads it in for Bolton's third goal. 3-1, looks all over for Blackpool. As unworried as ever, Matthew sends over a beautifully placed centre. Goalkeeper Hanson tries to check it, but Stan Mortensen forces it in. Bolton three, Blackpool two. Mortensen's hurt his right leg, but wild horses couldn't keep him off the pitch at this stage of the game. Douglas Holden leads the Wanderers on an offensive. Up near the goal mouth, Lofthouse gets on with the good work. Lofthouse centres, but Goalie Farm is there to deal with the situation this time. His clearance upfield sets his teammates on another attack. There's a foul. One of the players took quite a knock, and the ref awards Blackpool a free kick. Mortensen takes it. He's done it. It's in. Blackpool and Bolton are on even terms with three goals apiece. Matthews again, giving the game everything he's got. In the Bolton goal, Hanson gets ready for work. The great little wizard has it again. A flick to centre finds Perry, who crashes it home into the Bolton net. Blackpool four, Bolton three. There's no doubt about it now. Matthews, recently ignored by the England selectors, is the man of the match. What a great reception he gets from all at Wembley as the whistle goes. Matthews, in his third cup final, is the hero of the day.
Her Majesty the Queen rises to greet the two teams and to award the cup. And here come the winners, Gallant Blackpool, who turned what seemed defeat into one of the most dramatic victories ever seen at Wembley. Their captain, Harry Johnston, receives the most coveted football trophy of them all. A royal congratulation for Stanley Matthews and a winner's medal at long last are fitting rewards for the most dazzling sportsman in world soccer. Queen waves a last farewell to the crowds as Harry Johnston and Stanley Matthews take the cup to Blackpool. Eleven men come back to Blackpool to one of the greatest welcomes ever accorded a football team. Yes, they're the Blackpool boys who won the match of the century at Wembley against Bolton Wanderers. Heading towards the tower, the procession continues its triumphal journey. A hundred thousand loyal fans give a cup winner's reception to Harry Johnston and his team. But there's a special cheer for man of the match, Stanley Matthews. The coach arrives at Blackpool's town hall and 15,000 people surge forward for a closer glimpse of their heroes. Harry Johnston, complete with cup, is followed by Matthews and the rest of the gallant 11 to the gaily decorated town hall where the mayor makes an official speech of welcome and congratulates the team on their magnificent achievement. The crowd roars for Matthews, at long last a holder of a cup winner's medal. Modestly, he replies. Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'd like my name to be associated with uh, Harry. And I do want to say what a wonderful reception you have given us. And I also want to say that I'm told that by one or two people that I was the match winner. As a matter of fact, I don't believe that for the simple reason we have here 11 match winners. Already the team have vowed to do their darndest next year to keep the cup in Blackpool. In that same year of 1953, the international team received a dramatic shock. It came from an unexpected quarter. Hungary were plotting England's downfall. England in white shirts take the field with their Hungarian opponents at Wembley. A hundred thousand people put up the houseful notice as the visitors, recognized as the best side in Europe, immediately swing to the attack. Hidikuti receives and he bangs it past Merrick for a goal. Hungary one up in the first 45 seconds. The Hungarian captain slips it over to Hidikuti, who shakes the net with goal number two. Now Hungary are really in their stride. Puskas, with superb control, crashes in yet another. 3-1 to the visitors. Alf Ramsey has it. He draws the defence before flicking it to Matthews on the wing. The little wizard whips it into the centre where Mortensen gives Grossix a spot of work. Mortensen to Jackie Sewell and as cool as they come, he bangs it into the visitor's net for the equaliser. But don't make any mistake, these Hungarians didn't win the Olympics final or their second to none reputation for nothing. Here they go again, with some of the most perfect teamwork ever seen on the green grass of Wembley. And Bosic takes a free kick, and Puskas finishes the job. 4-1 now. But now Sewell takes command, teaming up with Maestro Matthews. Rob's header sends Grossick sprawling to save. That's the stuff to raise English hopes. But it's Stan Mortensen's low drive that chalks up another one on England's account. <laughs> 